you a sense. Okay, hello, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, and good afternoon, Nick. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, and to all the students who are watching this, uh, we have Professor Nicholas Tejakote from Knox College, and today we are going to learn about how a creative writing major is structured. Uh, this session is recorded, and, and you, you'll see that this session is a part of a playlist of what to study at college, and there you'll see multiple videos about different, different majors and how they are structured. And before we get going, let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Nicholas Rejagote uh, to you. Uh, Nicholas Rejagote was born and raised in Southern Maine. Uh, since that time, he has lived in Florida, gone to college in Virginia, worked on roofing crews, worked in a Delhi, uh, and has earned his MFA in uh, a master's in fine arts in poetry from the University of Iowa Winters Workshop, Writers Workshop. He's had a good fortune to live in Italy once on a Fulbright year in Campania and second time as a visiting professor in Florence. His poems have appeared in Denver Quarterly, Phoebe, 14 Hills, Copper Nickel, New American Writing, Descant, Bennington Review, Colorado Review, and elsewhere. His book of poems, American Massif, is forthcoming from Cupello Press. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, and Nick is an associate professor of English at Knox College, where he is the director of the program in creative writing. A very warm welcome to you, Nick. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And we are looking forward to learning more about creative writing as a major. And uh, uh, my first question to you is what uh, is creative writing and what is the academic structure of creative writing across the four years? Well, first off, thank you, Devesh. I appreciate your energy, the enthusiasm and optimism of this whole occasion. So how delightful, I'm so happy to be with you. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to give you a sense of the shape of the program. So it's a program in making art, really, and it goes back quite a ways. It's a program that was started in 1967. And since that time, it's innovated in any number of ways, but always emphasizes a couple of things. The first thing it emphasizes, as soon as a student arrives, Devesh, is a sense of community, building a community of artists. Uh, we're not interested in, mo in a monoculture. That is, we're not interested in cranking out one kind of writer. We're not interested in making uh, uh, a student who's only capable of producing one kind of thing, that is, to write like me, per se. Rather, we embrace lots of different voices. Uh, we embrace all kinds of different stories and ways of sharing them. Um, and one of the ways we cultivate that community is in a workshop setting, uh, in a classroom, which I can say more about in a, in a little bit, but also in terms of our readings. There are reading series. Um, so we'll have visiting writers from of national reputation from around the country and around the world, but also students give readings, particularly our seniors. There's a senior re writers reading series. And to gauge the health of the community, uh, as, as one of our goals, it's particularly pre-COVID, but not only, during COVID, through Zoom, you could see these incredible numbers, Devesh, people showing up and not only applauding, but truly listening. We're really listening to each other. So um, one of the things that makes me feel good about my part in this program is the community. The second uh, main emphasis of the program is developing, at the same time as developing community, developing the voice of the individual writer. Uh, so upon arrival, even in the early entry level courses, a beginning nonfiction course, for instance, we're interested in tapping into each student's unique sources of authority um, and helping that student to express herself in a way that doesn't necessarily match anybody else's way. 
So we can present, as we do, models to emulate. Um, but we also challenge students while they're learning those models, learning conventions, to break with them meaningfully, to develop their own way of doing things. So those are the two main emphases of the program. How it's carried out practically, uh, you can read about in our catalog, but it, it boils down to 12 credits. Five of those are workshops. So Devesh, it's a crazy amount of time. It's like 200 hours of really intensive exchange between professors and students. A lot in the classroom, sometimes in, <laughs> you might not believe this, but a four and a half to five hour session per week, 7.30 to midnight sometimes. And during those times, we're really able to pour over phrases, sentences, images to really appraise the work that's in front of us and celebrate it, but also uh, to see where its potential is, how it can be better. Um, so five workshops over the course of their career at Knox, at least, many take more. Uh, the other component of the major, the 12 credits, in addition to the five workshops, there would be five literature electives. So courses in underrepresented literatures, um, underrepresented voices, uh, courses in, in literature written before 1900, things like that, Shakespeare, um, courses in literature and power, so courses that account for uh, systemic things and, and things that are arising in discourses that are very current in politics, but always an emphasis on art and how art is absorbing and addressing the things in the world. Uh, there's also an allied art component. So every student who majors in creative writing must take a course in another art. So dance, theater, painting, these kinds of things would plug into our major. And the last thing, which I, won't, I don't need to get into is our capstone course, um, which brings everything together in the last semester of each student's senior year. That, Devesh, is a sketch of the major. Does that mm -hmm. give you a sense of it? Yes, yes, absolutely. I get a, a great sense of it and, you know, it's, it's uh, I think this is the first time I'm listening so deeply about creative writing. I've always thought creative writing is like creative writing. I mean, uh, but but of course, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, what are some of the concentration within creative writing, like uh, different kind of you know, writing styles? Or, or what are some of the concentrations that you'd like to share with us? The program offers courses in a number of genres. So you may study poetry, fiction, nonfiction, playwriting, and screenwriting. Um, and I, I should say that the major requires you to actually take more than one. So you may specialize in one, but you are required to, to experiment in more than one. We really believe in the importance of how one informs or cross-pollinates with the other. I find, Ivesh, a lot of times that if I can work with a student in nonfiction to start to churn up the stories that make the person who she is, from which she draws great authority, who she's grown up with, where, under what conditions, what she's been through, who she's lost, and you know what she's accomplished, that material, oftentimes, just getting it down on paper, will inform and embolden her in another genre to begin to form it in a new way. So this happens all the time between those uh, different, we'll say concentrations, but different genres. And also, there's a lot of hybridizing between the genres. So lots of things are possible, but those are the basic ones. Okay, okay, that, that's, that's great. Um, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, playwriting, screenwriting, yeah. Okay, uh, now what, what kind of students 
uh, you know, or what kind of a skills should a student develop, uh, a high school student should develop uh, in order to do well uh, in, in creative writing as a major? Okay, Devesh, it sounds like there's two questions. What kind, so, of, mm -hmm. what kind of student would do well in the program? What kind of skills might she need to do well in the program? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so um, <laughs> to respond to the first question, that's a hard one because I work with so many different kinds of people. So I'm thinking, Devesh, of, of the last spring we just, we just concluded. I worked with students who were from urban centers of Chicago, um, rural Illinois. I worked with a student from North Texas. I worked for, with students from all different places, but also all different, um, we'll say, socioeconomic backgrounds. And also students whose parents had gone to college and students who hadn't, who were first generation going to college for the first time in their family. Um, I will say many of our students who might not have felt at home in their high school, might not have felt comfortable, might have felt a little bit on the margin, find a place here. That's because we celebrate each person's peculiarity. For me, Devesh, that's not a bad thing. The peculiar is an immense strength. And so I welcome all different kinds of people and I have them in my classes and they teach each other. The skill set is also hard to define because no sooner do I think, oh, here's a formula for success. Here's the formula for writing a great story. Then I meet somebody who defies it, breaks all the conventions and writes some unorthodox, surprising and beautiful thing. So perhaps the skill set, first of all, you have to be willing to work at the craft and to challenge yourself. Um, you have to be able to listen, to really listen, to be open to difference and different stories. Um, but also I think have a love for language, have a love for crafting phrases and images and to revel in the material of your language. Um, those things are, are rather essential. A little bit of humility helps too. Um, but <laughs> I realized too, as I say that, that I don't know about you, but when I arrived in college, I was a different person than when I left. <laughs> I was a, a little more full of myself than when I left. Yes, absolutely. A little bit of humility takes you a long, long way. Yeah. Superb. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I, I got an idea of uh, what all skills a student should think about or, you know, of, uh, sort of develop uh, during their high school, right? Uh, of course, I think uh, uh, one, one skill that I would imagine is reading. Like, only if you read well, th only then you can sort of write well, I imagine, right? Amen. Yes, yes. I mean, when I said, emphasized a love for the language, I take for granted, you're right, I take for granted that there's a love for reading and that it's been developed a long time. And mm -hmm. you carry, it's the kind, of, the kind of students that carry around stories or poems in their head and think about them, even songs too. People who listen to yeah. a lot of music and think about the lyrics. Yes, that there's a love for reading and listening, absolutely. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. So my next question to you is, what are the typical career options that students pursue upon graduation? Uh, see, all of your questions present different challenges, Devesh. <laughs> uh, here's, the, here's the difficulty here. I'm gonna to refer to, I jotted some notes in response to this. Mm -hmm. uh, before I look at them, I'm just going to say, the ability to communicate in a creative and empathic way is almost a superpower uh, in my judgment. Given the challenges of today's world, the pace of media, the nature of truth and its challenges, to be able to form a complete sentence 
uh, in a persuasive way is incredibly marketable. And not only to go on and, and only be a writer or only teach in academia. So to, to illustrate that, I'll just go through my list, Devesh, of the people, the kinds of positions that our graduates have found. So mm -hmm. this is not very old, actually. The, some of the recent ones are so a journalist, of course, but also we have a graduate who went on to be a psychotherapist, professors, of course. Um, we have various social workers and advocacy people. We had a senior defense analysis analyst, someone who worked for the, the State Department, environmental engineers. We have various film producers, including a documentary film producer. Um, Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I could read the entire list, but you would almost, you, only, you might not believe me how various it is. But certainly it's true that industries that require persuasive use of language. So in law, in teaching, certainly in advertising, you know, we place students in apprenticeships in advertising and um, publishing quite frequently, but in the world of business, particularly now, you you have another question about what's the future, how what's the future of of this discipline. There at Knox, there is a development in collaboration between business and creative writing, because you've probably noted in the way in which on most websites there's an attention to the consumer and the ways in which a business has to imagine that consumer's life is really essential, right? To be able to almost uh, tell stories, to anticipate what consumer will be attracted to their product. So <clears throat> that has a great value, but I also like to think that the value of someone being able to articulate her story and to persuade someone to imagine her position through empathy is incredibly powerful, just as a citizen of any country on earth, right? Um, so lots of different possibilities, uh, I think, for any student who obtains a degree in creative writing to use that language. Absolutely, I, I never thought it that way, you know, I never thought a creative writer uh, would uh, be so critical in helping the business, you know, uh, 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 present stories and eventually, you know, maybe uh, present their products, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, would you like anything? Would you like to add anything about the future uh, of creative writing? Where do you see it going? Of course, you added that it's getting more. Uh, sort of uh, businesses are working hand in hand with creative writers. Uh, what else do you see creative writers doing? Or, or uh, another part of this question is uh, any new genre uh, or any new kind of creative writing uh, you see evolving in the coming years or months? And you were also talking about models, uh, but, but maybe that is something we will come to towards the end, models in writing. Uh, okay, so there were a lot of things in, the, in that question. Um, I, where I started our session was in a, our history that the program began in 1967. You know, if I, I wasn't alive, but I know a little bit about the 60s and, and, and the world at that time. Uh, there are alarming similarities in terms of what's happening in our in our country to what was happening then. And what's amazing to me is the way in which the arts, and particularly writing, evolve in order to absorb and to reflect upon what's happening. So in 1967 and 1977, there was no social media, but certainly there were crises and certainly there were um, partisans for one kind of truth as opposed to an alternate you know alternate fact so-called 
Um, similarly, there, there are now only, we have social media and the pace of communication is astonishing, right? So there's a, there might be a temptation, certainly I've talked about it with colleagues, Devesh, about let us simply feed into the trend and meet the trend. Uh, perhaps we could present courses on texting or I have no idea. Uh, I find that students aren't that interested in uh, taking courses or pursuing things that they now have grown up with, you know, texting each other and um, Instagram and so forth, whatever media. Rather, they, they form new combinations. So what's the future? The future is partly it's already happened. I mean, there, there have always been amalgams or different combinations and hybrids of different ways of writing. So the distinction between genres, even if I tell you we have poetry, we have nonfiction, fiction, playwriting, screenwriting, sometimes the, the boundaries between them are illusory and it's hard to tell. Uh, so this generation of students embraces those blurring of distinctions. The other thing they, they embrace, surprisingly maybe, is the slow, quiet work of reading. It's universal and it's held up over time. So that extraordinary writing when encountered in the quiet of one's mind and just sitting to read is still um, surprising, dynamic, extraordinary, life-changing. So there are opportunities for students to slow down, to read always closely. The last thing I'll say, um, insofar as it's useful, might speak to these different combinations and embracing the quiet and slow is, um, we have a budding young program in letterpress. I don't know if you've ever seen a letterpress, but the, you, mean, you know the old printing presses where, you know, if you go back to Gutenberg and Caxton, the, the typesetting, the small type into the galley and then the inking and then the printing on a piece of paper. So we have a letterpress shop, um, thanks to Hal Keener, an alum from 1967. And we have several presses and I coordinate that shop. And boy, what a, a revelation to many students to encounter language in that way. When you have to take, let's say I take a, a poem of, of 200 words which would be nothing to type up into my word processor or, or <laughs> into Facebook or wherever, but to then take the time to typeset all of that and then print it, it's really wonderful how it renews your sense of syntax, punctuation, the weight, the physical quality of a word. So things are happening here that not only embrace the pace of change and social media and that quickness, but also the slow and the quiet. So there are all these different means of expressing yourself available to students when they come to Knott's. Wow, that's fascinating. That, that's fascinating. And I can imagine how students would benefit from the letterpress, you know, attention to details. Like you, you start paying so much attention to detail because a small error here or there, you know, it, 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 it ruins the whole thing. Yeah, that, that's one of the things. And I'm sure I, I patience, they develop patience for, for doing work. Yeah, yes. amazing. Thank you for that word, patience. Patience is big. Well, I don't know if in your schooling you ever had to write a letter to someone far away. I remember in my early days of schooling, mm -hmm. I think I had to do that. Yeah. Anyway, I remember writing letters, and I've 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 started to resume letter writing. I, sometimes I use a typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but I love the physical, the tactile demand on me. You know, to to make it make me be more patient. Yes, a good I, I was language. I was looking at the machine, and I was thinking, um, <laughs> is it still functional? <laughs> but absolutely, it is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so my my final question to you is, uh, uh, what what are some of the books that you would recommend to a high school student? Uh, a, a few books, you know, fiction, nonfiction, uh, that they should read uh, to um, sort of 
broaden their horizons? Oh, wow. That that one I wasn't prepared for. Was that on your list? Because no, you, know that what, not. <laughs> you know what happens when you ask that question, like 200 titles come to mind and it's hard to choose one. Yeah, that, that was, I'm gonna, I have to get you back for that one, Devesh. Okay, okay. Well, no, no, let, just let, give me, <laughs> give me a second here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Well, um, books that would be useful to have read prior to attending Knox, is that your question? Hmm. I mean, really, really anything, but uh, let's see. I, I like, first that comes to mind is a book of essays by an Italian writer, Natalia Ginsburg, G-I-N-Z-B-U-R-G. She has a book of essays called um, Little Virtues. Okay. Um, I think often of a poet from who, who came in, in, into her powers, the peak of her powers, maybe in 50s and 60s, Gwendolyn Brooks in the 60s, Gwendolyn Brooks's poems uh, from Bronzeville. Um, for fiction, I think of, um, well, I can always think of teachers of mine too. Um, there's one Pulitzer Prize winning fiction writer named James Allen McPherson. Actually, he has a book called Elbow Room, which is extraordinary. His student, who is a classmate of mine, his name is Peter Orner. Um, I would recommend almost anything of his, any collection of stories. Um, you see what's going to happen? I'm going to just start keep saying names, and I don't know what is going to be to you. Okay. Uh, I think I've, I've got a couple of them now. I've got Elbow Room and uh, The Little Virtues, right? Little Virtues. Okay, uh, sorry for putting you on the spot there. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's fine. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, this session. Uh, it was a pleasure learning about creative writing, about how your the program at Knox is structured, uh, and about the concentrations, about the, the skills that a student should develop, and uh, uh, where creative writing is heading as a major. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today and it, it was a pleasure uh, speaking with you and, and learning about creative writing. Likewise. It was great to meet you, Devesh. I hope to see you again in the future. Absolutely.